Well, my goodness. So that is the first time I have ever been announced by him that he did not insult and berate me the entire time that he was up. <laughs> and I kept waiting for it. And it turns out he's actually good at legit introductions. I've never seen that before. Thank you. Thank you very much. You must be on your medicine again. That's amazing. I mean, he did, instead of handing me a mic, he did hand me this, expecting me to talk through this. Like, All right, so happy to see you here today. Jamie, will you hold on to this for me, buddy? Because I don't want to lose that. I need that. No, oh, it's a good catch. Hey, Jamie was actually with me in the uh, prison that he mentioned in Columbia. In the <laughs> it is a miracle. He, it's a miracle he and I have not been killed several different times. And uh, he's been traveling with me for more than 20 years. He and I have been friends since we were little boys. Um, he, we both met in Joshua Elementary School, big time Joshua, Texas, because I would, I would get sent to the principal's office every day to get a spanking, and he would be waiting to get his spanking. That is a true story. Guys, my lifelong buddy Jamie Cash is here. Jamie, stand up and say hi to everybody. Yep. That guy was actually in prison with me when all that mess happened, and Jessica Rabbit, the game warden, came in. And I was like, this is not good. And I want to tell you, those spirits can sniff me out. When there's, when there's sexualization of kids, women, anywhere, they sniff me out. And I, I, can, I can sniff them out, I promise. And I was like, oh, there's something nefarious going on in this dadgum prison, and, like, I don't know what's going on. We went in there. They put us in a room with 170 guys and locked the door and told those guys to kill us. That is a true story. And he was right there with me. And I got a spoiler alert. We did not die. <laughs> I'm just going to get to the chase. That was a great miracle. Anyway, it's a great miracle he's here tonight, and he's just, he just got out of prison himself. Doesn't he look good? Hallelujah. <laughs> Sitting next to him, I need to also tell you, is um, a very good friend of mine. He's been on my board for years and years and years. He just came on board with Troy Brewer Ministries, Anson International, Spark Worldwide, Open Door Church, and the Open Door Food Banks, all those different things that I run. He came on to help me run all those things. He's my chief operating officer, and he actually lives here in Seattle. Guys, this is Bill Garson. Say hi to everybody. So he lives here for two or three weeks, and then he goes down to Burleson, Texas, and he lives there for two or three weeks. But all of his family lives here, and he's originally from here. So um, this guy sitting next to Jamie, I have no idea who that is. I, the last time that I was here, Pastor Darren Stott came out. I was doing a star party here. Okay, how many of y'all were here at the star party? Guys, it was so good. It was so good. And the reason I say that is because Pastor Darren is the one who changed the way that I did it. Now, I'm kind of a 50-pound head, and I know that's intimidating to him. I'm really smart. And when I was like, and he's like, hey, man, listen, you don't need to get up here and teach. You just need to get up like and play your guitar like you do out at Redemption Ranch. And I'm like, nobody wants, to, no, nobody wants to spend an evening in the fire with me playing my guitar and shooting the bull about the stars. Like, I want to show them the word of God and all this. And he goes, nah, let's do this. <laughs> and I said, okay. And we did it. And now I changed that. Now that's what I do at every church now that I go to. And so you guys were a catalyst, and I'm saying thank you for that. <clears throat> I want to... I want to set this up in a couple of different ways. Number one, at the end of this, you're going to be opening up an envelope. Do y'all say envelopes or envelopes up here? You say envelopes. Okay, well, I do too. I say envelopes. But I thought y'all said envelope, and I was trying to be nice. Okay, so do y'all have y'all's envelopes? Do y'all have them? No. Okay, so can I ask my friends to go ahead and grab a couple of boxes of those? And here's the deal, pickle. No peeking. Okay, no peeking. Just hold on to it. Don't lose your mind and open it up. Just hold on to it. And at the end of this, we're going to have a prophetic moment because I have no idea what prophetic word is in that. And so there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of possibilities within it. And my elders put all these things together. And then they print it up in a really nice way so that you can put that in your Bible or your refrigerator, depending upon which one you go to the most. 
Like that, man? Kidneys, baby. It's right here, kidneys. And uh, you can use that for your own encouragement for the rest of the year and go, no, this is a word that God gave me. This is my word, okay? So one of Pastor Darren's world-famous deacons or deaconettes will be handing those out to you. And you just hold on to those things. And then at the end of this, we'll all open them up together. Amen. It's good to see so many friends in here today and uh, bless you and call you blessed. Are you guys ready to get off into the word? Amen. Uh, since the last time that I was here with y'all, I, was, uh, I have been in a whole bunch of different nations. I'm going to be in Uganda next week, and then I'll be, I'll be there for two weeks, and then I'll be in South Africa the week after that. And since that time, uh, we have just been all over. I have been so busy. I can't even tell you. I've just been gone. Honestly, it is just a blur to me now. It's like I've lived 100 lifetimes since the last time I saw y'all. And it really wasn't that long ago, was it? I mean, it really wasn't. I'm like, wow. Um, one of the things that happened since the last time that I was with you was that we went to Mexico. We were there for nine days. We rescued 51 boys and girls out of sexual trafficking in nine days. It was amazing. I got to spend a lot of time with the president of Mexico and do a whole bunch of dignitary things. I spoke to the United Nations, and that's always fun for a guy like me to get to speak to those guys, and they think I'm going to be super diplomatic, and I'm not. I'm always surprised that they bring me back. I get up there, and I say, listen, man, if you are a part of sexual trafficking, Jesus is coming to get you. And I tell them that. And, like, you don't like it, then just don't have me back. Amen. And they keep inviting me back, and it's just so funny to me. Um, I'm going to get to be back. In, I just got invited back to speak to Congress in the month of July, the Congress of the United States. Hallelujah. And I cannot believe that they invited me back. I cannot believe it because I was told, uh, Mr. Brewer, sir, we'd like to brief you on exactly what you're supposed to speak on and, of course, what you're not. Now, due to certain protocol, we're not going to be speaking against pornography today. Oh, we're not. At an anti-sexual trafficking conference, we're not going to be speaking, and we're not, and I got to, I told him again, I said, I haven't heard the word pornography one time through this entire day. Like, why is that? The reason why that is, is because the pornography industry spends hundreds of millions of dollars a year lobbying, lobbying your Congress so that they will not enforce the laws that already exist. They are prostitutes. See, you... I can't believe anybody would invite me back. Amen. And they did. So I, I got up there and I just said, hey, um, so I get up there and like, ladies and gentlemen, a man who has rescued more than 10,000 children from sexual exploitation throughout the world, Pastor Troy Brewer. Clap, 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 clap. Mr. Brewer, thank you so much for attending this. We understand that you have a few minutes, and sir, you have the floor. I said, pornography is the reason why we're here today. That's true. <laughs> Man, these, these people, these fellas started looking like they were scalded cats. Y'all should have saw the look on their face. So funny, man. Anyway, I'm going to be back there. All right, I think everybody's got those things passed out, right? Everybody got one? If you do not have one, if you'll raise your hand, say, hey. Please don't leave me out. Okay. All right, guys, um, at the beginning of every year, I fast the first 10 days of the year. Seek the Lord Seek the Lord for the year to come. And, dude, it's 11-11. Sorry to throw that out there. Are there any 11-11 people in here? Mmm, weirdos. That's my tribe. Come on. In February, you know, just a few days ago, it was 222, and everybody lost their mind. My phone blew up, y'all. <laughs> I was on a Trinity Broadcasting Network yesterday. I, did anybody get a chance to see me on there? Y'all like, no, this Pacific Northwest, we don't watch it in that mess. So, anyway, I was on Trinity Broadcasting Network yesterday, and um, it was 29. It was, leap, it was leap day, right? And plus, 29 is the number for overcoming mountains. I think some of you guys know that, right? Like, how do you know that? Because there's 29 mountains that are listed in the Word of God that are named. There's 29 of those. And like, how do you know? Because I counted them. Amen. 
And it's also in Meredith's big book, A Bible List. It's got 29 mountains that are listed there. But if you ever get a chance to go to Nepal and help me rescue some boys and girls there, one of the things I'll do is I'll end up taking you to Mount Everest because anytime I go to Nepal, I want to head out to Mount Everest. I mean, why would you not do that if you, can, if you have the chance to do that? Not that I climb it. I mean, I have an asthma attack just looking at it. But, I mean, even, even the base camp is 18,000 feet up. And, I mean, and there's no air. And you will have a screaming headache the whole time. And you will fly in a 1951 helicopter that should have been shut down about 60 years ago that has a rotor on the inside. And if you touch it, your arm will pull off. And then you will fly that through the Himalayas for the chance to get to be at base camp for Mount Everest for about 30 minutes before you pass out from not having any oxygen. Come go with me. It's some fun. <laughs> Amen. But I can tell you about the Word of God. It's all about overcoming mountains. And on the 29th, I was like, Lord, this was yesterday. Lord, I want to leap forward in how I overcome mountains this year. I want to I leap forward in an incredible way. That's what I want to do. Because I know, God, that there's 29 mountains. I know that it's leap year, which means acceleration, right? It means we're going to add something to this thing that only happens every once in a while. On the Gregorian calendar, it happens that every single four years we have to have one of those to kind of make up because everything is a little bit off, and we don't want it a little bit off, so it's the adjustment. Whatever is a little bit off, may it be adjusted during this season in the name of King Jesus. It's a time of the Lord doing that. But friends, Mount Everest that has a prophetic name is the tallest mountain on the planet Earth. Mount what? Ever rest. Amen. Was overcome by 29-year-old Sir Edmund Hillary on May the 29th of the year 1953. And if you do a Google search and say, hey, Siri, how tall is... Mount Everest, it'll say 29,029 feet tall. Amen. Now, that is an example of God Almighty declaring a word all the way around us all the time, and many times we just can't see the forest for the trees because there's a word in everything going on around us. And as prophetic people living in these last days, we have to know, dude, the kingdom of heaven is just like that. The kingdom of heaven is just like that. If that was a dream, what would that mean? There's no way I can be behind this car with that license plate without hearing God speak. It's a big part of last day's living. While the world is being deceived by its intake of the hive mind, and instead of authentic wisdom, artificial intelligence, and the wisdom of this age... Instead of the wisdom that is from above, you and I have to be caught up within a very sharp. I mean, you don't have to be smart. You can, you can, you can walk in the power of God. I mean, look at Pastor Darren. You, can, you don't have to have... You, you don't have to have your act together in a tremendous way. He's a living example. <laughs> No, what you have to have is the audacity to say yes and to believe God in the midst of you and in, in, in spite of you in the midst of people that do not get what it is that, that you get and do not see what it is that you're seeing because all of your critics that make fun of you publicly will end up calling you privately if you'll walk in it long enough. Isn't that the truth, y'all? So I seek the Lord and say, God, I want a word for the year to come, and I really believe that we're in a lull between shutdowns. Like, oh, I don't want to hear that. Too bad. I'm going to tell you all the truth. Is that okay? Is it all right if I tell you all the truth today? That's why I have such a sense of urgency to get as much stuff done as I can get done right now. Because what I can get done now is not necessarily what I can get done later. And that is the wisdom of the Lord. That you need to know not only the time and the season, but what Israel ought to do. And that's a big part of living an Issacharian lifestyle. Just use that term, Issacharian lifestyle. The Bible says that the sons of Issachar had prophetic wisdom of the times and the seasons and of knowing what Israel ought to do. Amen. So at this conference, I want to tell you that a big, a big part of living in the day and having triumphant supernatural victory is the knowledge of the signs of the times. 
And they can literally help us turn to the Lord because it gives us a kingdom insight, prepares ourselves for his second coming. Is there anybody in here that has the audacity to believe that Jesus is coming back again? Okay. Some of you are like, okay, that's kind of pie in the sky, but I need kind of a pep top for me to get through my day today. No! You don't need a pep top. You need the power of God in your life. You, you need something different. You need transformation. Listen, my good friend, and I'm telling you, one of my greatest mentors and some, a lady that I love like you cannot believe is Patricia King. Do you understand that she left this conference to see if she could raise her buddy from the dead? I want friends like that. Do you understand that's why she left? Oh, Troy, I'm so sorry. My friend died, and I've got one day before they put him in the ground. I need to go see if we can resurrect him. Now, that's what just happened. Okay, that's no joke for her. Listen, every, every time any, any one of my friends dies, well, depending on if I like him or not, we have a resurrection party. We have a resurrection party. And literally the body will be in the room, and we'll all get together before we haul them off to the morgue or whatever's going to happen and say, let's all seek the Lord. And I want to tell you, it's a party. Like, we've got the rest of the week to mourn, but let's just see if the Lord does something. Let's just see. And we pray and we seek the Lord and we talk about his life and we talk about how much we loved him and how much we love each other. And we say, man, the power of God is here. Get up in Jesus' name. Everybody's like, you're nuts. Mmm, that ain't crazy. I could tell you what crazy is. And that is not crazy. Believing in resurrection power should not be crazy for a believer who believes in a resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. You're the one that's crazy if you say you're a Christian and you don't believe in resurrection. What? So the year 2024... Guys, we got to know the signs of the times. we got to know the word of God, and it's all about being watchful. 1 Peter 4, 7 says, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious. Be watchful in your prayers. Friends, this command to be watchful is in the Bible 24 times, and this is the year 2024. It's a year of God saying, you better look up. You better pay attention. You better sober up. You better get your act together. You better be consecrated and dedicated in your life to looking for the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. Because the kingdom is always coming, amen? But what does the word of God say that men's hearts fell there, they men's hearts fell them for fear in the last days? Do you get remember where it says? When they see the things coming up on the earth. So there's two things coming in your life: either terrible things or the kingdom. And you're going to see one or the other, and the choice is yours. Amen. If you believe that God highlights different words and themes at different times, then you understand the importance of knowing the signs of the times. So Jesus has pointed out some of the basic requirements to be able to sensibly interpret things. And that's why we need to know the word of God. That's why we need to be challenged by the word of God. And he even points out, dude, well, how is it that you can know the weather And you can tell what's going to happen weather-wise, but you can't tell what's going to happen by what's going on in the spirit. He's like, what is that all about? And then he actually says this. He says these words. He says, a wicked and evil generation requires a sign. And now are you ready? Are you ready? That's a horrible translation in the English language. What it should say is a wicked and adulterous generation requires an additional sign. Because he's telling them, dude, why can't you? He's getting onto them that they don't know the signs of the times, right? That's the context. And then they're like, show me another, show me another, show me another, show me another. And he says, no, a wicked and adulterous uh, generation needs another. I've given you enough. You should be already to know the signs of the times. That's what he's saying, correct? So it's like a wicked, a wicked and adulterous generation tells King Jesus, I demand more hoops for you to jump through. Uh, Come on, I'm not really impressed with that. Come on, come on. We could explain that away. I need you to do something else. See, that is the spirit of Herod. Show me a miracle. Bring me the miracle boy, and I want you to jump through my hopes. And God had nothing to say to him. Jesus had nothing to say to him. And then Herod went from applauding him to torturing him. You know that? 
So that's what he's talking about. He's like, dude, if you didn't see what I've already done, you ain't going to see this, and I'm not here to entertain you. Mm. You know what a blind entertainer is? It ain't King Jesus. It's Samson. You guys know what they did to him once he fell. He became a blind entertainer. I want to tell you, there's been too many blind entertainers in a body of King Jesus because they couldn't get their head out of the lap of Delilah. And all they're good at is entertaining people. And they do not know what God Almighty is doing. They do not know what God Almighty is saying. But, man, they, they're slick and they know how to talk. I want to quit being impressed with blind entertainers. Amen. So... These guys are saying, well, we don't have enough evidence to know what God is speaking today. These men are not suffering from a lack of evidence. They are suffering from rebellion and kingdom ignorance. People that are watchful are people that have the fear of the Lord, and people that are watchful are people that understand the kingdom. So your priority for the kingdom gives you an understanding of the kingdom. And I would say in the year 2024, that's one of the biggest things that you can do is just go, dude, I'm a kingdom person. I'm a kingdom man. I'm a kingdom woman. Let's go. I am all about the king having dominion, kingdom. And I'm not going to let any other king or any other God have dominion over my life. I serve King Jesus. Be a kingdom person, and then that, that will make you watchful. So, friends, we have two different, we have two different uh, years this year on the Gregorian encounter. If you want to go the three years, because King Jesus himself says there will, be sign in the, there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. And he said that in present, future tense. So it's super important that you understand that he was speaking to our generation. He's like, hey, Troy, when you get a whole bunch of hate mail and they say, you know, God doesn't talk like that anymore, Tell them that I said, no, there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Amen. Guys, I'm going to tell you, man, the heavens are being shaken right now. On April 8th, man, we got this next great American eclipse. The last one came right across your neck of the woods seven years ago after it passed over seven cities called Salem. You guys remember all that? Started off in Salem, Oregon, just a little bit south of here. Do you guys remember that day? Man. It was crazy cool. It ended at a place that was called Fort Sumter, and Fort Sumter is where the Civil War began. First shot fired, kaboom, from Fort Sumter. Rebellion of the 13 states, and 13 is a number that represents rebellion. And it was a rebellion against, against state versus federal rights. I know that you and I have all been taught it was about slavery, but the 13th Amendment was not passed until after the Civil War was over, and I encourage you guys to look it up. It was December the 6th of 1865, and I bet you've never been taught that. Oh, look, a chill just went through the whole room. Wait, stop. Yeah, that's my birthday, December the 6th. I was born to set people free. Amen. You guys with me? Amen. Never mind the fact it was 1865. It wasn't 1855. Abraham Lincoln, who was our 16th president, was a genius to make it a battle about the freedom of human beings and the end of slavery. But he's the one who changed it. And he changed it mid-war and actually got it done. Oh, Abraham Lincoln, man, I love him. Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president, you know, 16 is a number where we lay down our lives. You know that? 16 is a number that represents the love of God. 16, there's a number that represents when you, lay, when you lay down your life for the sake of somebody else. And Abraham Lincoln was the 16th president, and he laid down his life. Very powerful. There's 16 attributes of the love of God that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So why would I mention, why would I even mention that? You know, well, it wasn't actually about slavery. Well, no, it was ultimately about slavery. Because there was a man of God who was a visionary who understood, you know what, you can take a cause that may or may not be right and make it a kingdom cause and win the war. There had been no other nation in the history of the earth that God Almighty split up for the sake of the slaves except for Egypt. Oh, you guys still here, man. You guys need to, we need to know our history and we need to be able to see the kingdom in it. Hallelujah. It's like, man, what a powerful move of God that you can literally take something that may or may not be okay, and then you can literally go, wait, 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 let me tell you, I'm not going to make it all about that. I'm just going to make it all about King Jesus, and this is the heart of King Jesus, and this is the mountain I'll die on right here, and it's fighting the battle that God would fight, 
And you turn that into a kingdom cause, and God Almighty will change the war, and Gettysburg will happen. Up until Gettysburg, man, the North lost everything, and they were losing and losing and losing and losing and losing, and then Gettysburg happened, and they're like, what the heck just happened? Abraham Lincoln said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And God's like, okay, and then Jehovah Nisi showed up and turned the momentum. Anybody know when Gettysburg was over with? What was, the, what was the day that the South lost on Gettysburg? July the 4th. It wouldn't it be cool if you were taught this in school instead of all that crap that they're teaching you? Wouldn't it be amazing if we actually knew how, if we actually knew our true history and we saw it and went, there's no way that God Almighty cannot be a part of that. The kingdom of heaven is just like that. Wow! There you go. So it's the year 5784 on the Hebrew calendar, and it's the year 2024 in the Gregorian calendar. The Hebrew calendar has a prophetic marker of the moon. The Gregorian calendar has a prophetic marker of the sun. Amen. We could talk about the astro calendar, which we're about to enter into the age of Aquarius. I don't want to go off on that, but it's just as legit of a calendar as anything else is because God wants, the, God wants things to be marked, to be measured, to be weighed, to be numbered, and then finally to be named all to his glory. Now you can say, well, these calendars are flawed. Yeah, they are flawed. They sure are. Um, because they're the measure that men have put together. But know this, friends, you need to know this. The Lord Jesus Christ will step into your measurement because you don't know any better. If, if we knew how to do it right, it would be perfect. But it's not because men are involved in it. Like, well, I don't think, I think it's got to be perfect. No, it doesn't. Do you know what the standard of measurement is all the way up until the time of the Greeks and the Romans? And it doesn't matter. It's the Babylonians. It's the Medes. It's the Persians. It's the Greeks. It's the Romans or whatever it is, right? It doesn't matter. Like, what was the measure? A cubit. And what was a cubit? Well, it's from here to there. Do you see that big galoot of a man right over there, that giant beard? Yeah, that's him. Hey, man, stand up. Stand up. Now, the number one, this is what a real man is supposed to look like, by the way. Oh, well, y'all can stop looking at me for a minute. Now, if I could get your detention back to me, okay, I'm sorry. I want to tell you something. That brother's standard and my standard couple of inches off, right? But if I did 144 cubits and he did 144 cubits and I built something that was 144 cubits and he built something that was 144 cubits, if we put them side by side, they would be a little bit off. But the measure would not be off between me and the Lord because I did what he told me to do with the measure I had to measure with. Amen. Come on. So that whole thing of righteousness, it's like, okay, well, your measure might be a little bit different. I mean, some of you, um, you know, like the measure of alcohol. Should you ever, ever, ever be allowed to drink, be able to sip an alcohol? Well, that depends from church to church and from people to people and actually from person to person. There are some people who have no business whatsoever even taking a sip of alcohol. There are other people that they can, and I truly believe that. But here's the deal. Your cubit belongs to the Lord. And you had better serve the Lord with your measurement, whatever it is. Man, I just had my 35th wedding anniversary last week. Hallelujah. Been married 35 years. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. Woo! All right. So I had this, and I don't know if y'all have seen my wife, but she is drop-dead gorgeous. I mean, she's, it's, it's hilarious to me. I'm so glad I got her while she was young. Hallelujah. <laughs> Because she is something. And we're super happy together and we love each other. And I want to tell you, my measure and my cubit is to make my marriage a mission. Okay? My marriage is supposed to be a mission. And I am supposed to do everything that I do. I'm not supposed to live life considering my life without my wife. Now that I've said that, some of y'all got no business ever being married again. And that is your measure. I didn't get one single amen out of that. You hear me, Jamie? Jamie, I want, can I talk to you, dude? You've been through, what, nine divorces now? Okay. So let's go through this. 
Some of us should never get married again because your picker is broke. And until you know how to pick them, you have no business whatsoever, right? Okay, that's a different measure from person to person to person to person to person, and we do not compare those things. How am I doing? Get up here and teach the Word of God. Having a new ear for a new year is a big part of this thing. I call this the year of the Malchus miracle. I call this the year of the Malchus miracle. Now, y'all know who Malchus was? Malchus is the guy that Jesus, that Peter cut his ear off and Jesus planted it back on his head. Now, there's a couple of reasons why that happened. Number one, because, you know, it's not cool to have your ear cut off, and Jesus just likes to fix things. Another reason why, uh, the, another reason why that happened was simply because if Jesus had not put his ear back on his head, then the courts of the high priests could have accused Peter of the death penalty. And Peter was about to be standing there, and Jesus knew that he was the only other disciple that would go to the court of the high priest, besides Judas, who pointed him out. And then Peter said, I, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. And then he started cussing like the sailor he was. Amen. Jesus knew that Peter had the intention and the courage to go all the way into the courtroom, and all, all they had to do is say, that is the dude who dared to draw his sword against the high priest guard put him to death right here. So Jesus removed all the evidence. Now the reason why we know who it is, Malchus, is because the Christians that the word of God was being written to, written to knew Malchus. That's why he's listed by name. That he was not a Jew but he was a Gentile. Everybody knows Marcus, and we might as well let everybody know. Did you know that Jesus put his ear back on after his leader in the body of Jesus now cut it off? And so they included his name in it because the church knew his name. It's good stuff. This is the year of all that happening. This is a year of reconciliation. This is a year of redemption. And this is the year of God Almighty putting a new ear on you and go on here, that's better now. And, and a God-given ability to be able to tune in and hear God speak. I want to hear God speak in a, in a whole new way. If the Lord is living in a whole new way and if he's leading in a whole new way and if he's speaking in a whole new way, friends, I want to have an ear to hear. Amen. I want to say that when we go to the 84th verse of the of or if we look at the year 5784, and if I'm looking on the Hebrew year, I can tell you that the 84th verse in the Old Testament is Genesis 4-4, and that 4-4 means double door, right? 4 in the Hebrew means an open door. You guys know that, right? This is a double open door year. And that's good news, and that's good branding and marketing for a guy who runs Open Door Church in Burleson, Texas. Amen, I like that. But it, Genesis 4-4 tells us that God Almighty was pleased with the offering that Abel brought. How do you know that God Almighty is pleased with your sacrifice? Because fire falls on it. Fire, by the way, please say that one syllable if you would, fire. There you go, that's a good job. Y'all are awesome. I, I know everybody makes fun of me when I say fire. Everybody says fun of me when I say oil. Oh. I can't tell you how that pegs my cringe meter, say oil. He's just like, mm -hmm. I don't know why. But to me, that's always been a one-syllable word. And things like, you know, we don't do in Texas is like we don't pronounce our L's like I told you so. T-O-A-D. It's code outside. <laughs> man, they broke you. Or, man, they, they, man, after they made you, they broke the mode. So we don't pronounce the L's there, which is kind of weird, right? I have no idea why I'm telling you all that, except for it's just in my head. So how does, so, so here's the deal. Fire falls upon sacrifice. This is a year, man, that you can expect some things to light up. That God says, you know what? The world's never celebrated you in this place, but I've seen it. I've been there, and I've seen it. I know it. 
I understand it. Wow. You know what? Poof. Fire. I want to see some things ignited this year that I've been faithfully serving in for decades. Well, another one that goes with all that is the 24th verse. Wait, that's the 84th verse. And then here's the, the 84th verse. I'm going to go to the New Testament. And this is a really big deal. And this is Matthew 4.20. The 84th verse in the New Testament is they immediately left their nets and they followed him. Everybody say immediately. All of us in here are people who pray for suddenlies. Man, we love suddenlies. And man, we come before the Lord and say, God, I want to see some suddenlies happen in my life where everything changes on a dime and it pivots and it goes a different direction. And this is a year that King Jesus is saying to you, yeah, I, I need to see some immediately. Suddenlies are the responsibility of God. Immediately's are the responsibility of us. And if we're going to do this holy dance this year, the 84th verse of the New Testament tells us that those disciples, in the, in the paradigm of the only thing that they had ever known, dropped it on a dime to follow Jesus once he showed up. I wouldn't be like that this year. I'm praying and I'm seeking the Lord, friends, concerning my immediately's. Like, God, I need to immediately be willing, God, to get with the program. I was horrified on October the 7th of what the demonic group Hamas did to our friends in Israel, unlike um, anything that has shaken me in years and years and years. I, um, we have food banks and churches and outreaches all over Israel. We have an old folks' home for Ethiopian Jews in, Ash, in Ashkelon, um, I've spent a lot of time in Ashkelon. I've spent a lot of time in Gaza. I have good Palestinian friends that are Christians, and they're some of the most persecuted people on the, place, on the face of the planet Earth. Palestinian Christians living in Israel. And so we stand with them, we support them, we love them. And on Rosh Hashanah, in the month of September, on the Gregorian calendar, what is arguably the beginning of the new year, and I know the argument over that. And by the way, for those of y'all that want to argue over that, I would say, yeah, you're right, and I'm right, and we're all right, because there's four biblical new years. Like, why? Because, because the Jews just like things extremely complicated, is why. Because they love to argue with all of their friends. And so I'm like, okay. So I, if... I can tell you that at the beginning of Rosh Hashanah, every year I seek the Lord, we blow the trumpet, like, God, what is the, what's the word for the new year to come? And the Lord told me, Troy, I want you to look up the 5,784th verse in the Bible. Remember, in the year 5784. And this is that word. It's Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 25. In the street, the sword will make them childless. In their homes, Terror will reign. The young men and the young women will perish, the infants and those with gray hair. Does that look like October 7th to you? Guys, not only is the Bible prophetic, the Bible is prophetic in how it is written because that is a perfect description of the headlines after October 7th. Well, immediately after, and then after a couple of days, the predictable algorithms came in, and that's no longer what the story is. The story is about how horrible the people are that are going after their people who have been kidnapped. And I would just say this. If you don't like what they're doing, you wouldn't like what I'm doing. Amen. And this is also what I'd say. Rain on you. Amen. We're not intimidated. Not intimidated. We'll not be afraid. As we're rescuing boys and girls all over the world, and you do not play nice with rapist terrorists. Amen. You go after your kids and you rescue them. That's what you do. And when they scream you're not playing nice, you inform them we're not here to be nice. Amen. Hallelujah. The idea that we got to be nice and have everybody's approval is ridiculous. Friends, listen, if you're actually going to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and if you're going to walk with God, man, you're going to have haters. And here's what, I would, here's what I would say to you. If Joel Osteen cannot appease his haters... We do not have a chance. <laughs> because Joel Osteen has, is the nicest guy speaking the most gentle message on the face of the planet Earth, and he has people line up to shoot him. If that brother cannot appease his haters, I promise you, we as people of God living in a hostile world have no chance whatsoever. 
So let's love each other and let's be the people that God Almighty has called us to be. And let's, let's, let's show a brave face in the day that we live in. Amen. Amen. Well, great. well, Israel is God's prophetic timepiece. And we look at that. We know that we're living in the last days. We have some tremendous challenges. And everybody needs to buckle their seatbelt because we're not living 10 years ago. We're living in an accelerated time frame. In the year 2024, as the number 24 is a number that is related to worship, but it's always related to the throne of Jesus Christ. The number 24 is. It's a priestly number, and it's a number that represents priesthood. It's a number that represents um, the throne. And it has to do with worship, 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 worship. And like, why? Because the throne is here and the king is on it. It's a lot like the difference between Psalms 23 and Psalms 24. Psalms 23 is King Jesus comes to you in your valley and meets you in your hell and you are not afraid because you're aware of the manifest presence of God. Psalms 24 is when God invites you up out of your hell and out of your valley and into his throne room. Amen. Well, man, I, I'm saying I'm signing up for Psalms 24. And I love Psalms 24. And I would encourage you guys to read Psalms 24 and to go after that because it's all about asking the right questions. Who is the king of glory? Who may ascend? All those different deals. And actually getting the right answers. Here's a right question. King Jesus, is there anything you wish I knew that I do not know that I've got to know? King Jesus, is there anything I'm focused on that, I, that you wish I wasn't focused on so that I can see the thing that you want me to see? King Jesus, what is the thing, sir, that if I stepped into it, it would absolutely change every priority I've ever had, and I would be in the right track? Lord God Almighty, are there things that I could walk in that I don't believe that I can walk in? God, are there any promises for my future so that I can get through my hell right now? Listen, we got to learn how to write that. we got to learn how to ask the right questions this year. I don't want to ask the wrong questions. My chief operating officer, we always make fun of him because he says, I got questions, and he asks this thing all the time. We always quote him, I got questions. But it's because he is the best decision maker I've ever seen. I just recently told him that. And I'm telling you, I've I've known a lot of people, and I still know a lot of people, but Bill Garson is the best decision maker I have ever, ever, ever seen. And the reason why he can make such great decisions is because he knows the right questions to ask. Friends, you've got to ask the right questions. Now, the world is 24,000 miles around. There's 24 time zones around the planet Earth. There's 24 elders around the throne. There's 24 hours in a day, and that means full circle. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is yet to come. Amen. I think that I have a picture of the North Star. Let me see if we have that picture. He might not have put it in our group. Do you guys have a picture at all? Just a picture of a star? Way to go, man. Come on. That's what I'm talking about. That is the North Star, and everything circles the North Star, just exactly like the throne of King Jesus. Now, the North Star is the 50th brightest star, and 50 means jubilee. It's if you can find it, you'll be set free. Also, if you can find the North Star, you'll never be lost again. How many of y'all have heard that? Everything circles the North Star. Everything does, and it has to do with being pinpointed, finding your true north, which is Jesus, your king, on the throne. So if you're going to live in your most, if you're going to live your best life this year and be the most effective in the body of King Jesus, you're going to have to sit Jesus continually before you as King David did. King David the rock star, King David the poet, King David the lover, King David the king, King David the prophet, King David the general, King David the man of war, King David... Why do, you know, man, like, I, I think these things all the time. Hey, if I could have, if I could have you know, dinner with, a top, with my top ten favorite authors, who would that be? And I start thinking about all my favorite authors. And there's some of my favorite authors, I don't like their books near as much as I like the people that wrote them. Like Hemingway is one of those people. Everybody's like, Hemingway, Hemingway's a genius. I'm like, okay, whatever. I, but I love Hemingway. Uh, he actually crashed an airplane in Uganda. I don't know if you know that. Because he was flying around like you do in the early 1900s in a small airplane that he had flown from the United States. And he was drinking and he crashed. <laughs> I literally tracked through the jungle to find his wreckage and I found it. 
It's at Murchison Falls, Uganda. Look it up. And I paid a guide to walk me out there where there's lions and all kinds of madness it's just so I could find his wreckage. And I found it. Like, why not? Because it's fun. Amen. <laughs> and it's awesome. I mean, who else do you know that's ever done that? Like, man, that would be great. So I did, I did that. And Leanna's like, okay, let's go. Okay. Poor Leanna. But I could not have a table full of authors that King David would not be there. He's one of my favorite writers ever. What about songwriters? I'm a songwriter. I'm a professional songwriter. I've been writing songs my whole life. I have over 3,000 songs that I've published. Okay, done all that. Great. Who would be your famous songwriters? Oh, man, listen. I'm tell you, oh, man, I got some doozies. And I would start listening to those. And I would have the, There's no way that I cannot have King David there. We're still singing his songs 3,000 years later. Psalms 24 is one of his songs. You try that to the tune of House of the Rising Sun and see what happens. Oh, I'm crazy. So, okay. Well, what about prophets? Like, come on, Darren, if you could, famous prophetic people, who would sit at your table? Who would that be? Bobby Connor? Who else? Who? Charlie Champ? Wow. All time? Yeah, they go right out the window. That's what you just did. I knew that was going to happen. You hadn't got to me yet, by the way. I'm pretty current. (laughs) Who? William Branham, right on. John G. Lake, maybe? Yeah, I'll definitely have him. You might invite me? Do you share when you eat? No? Okay, I'm not coming. So... Now that I've said all that, how could you not have King David there? He's one of the greatest prophets of all time. Or if we talk about warriors, and I'm a huge nut about history, and so I'm like, hey, what warriors would you want there? I would have to have Davy Crockett there. I'm a big Davy Crockett fan. Like, okay, that kind of makes sense, you know. Okay, whatever. Like, who else? Oh, no, I would start going through the greatest sniper ever. I, I, would, I, I know those guys. But how could you not have King David there? How could you not have King David there? I mean, he's got to be there. Or kings. I actually know kings, like real kings. I know real presidents, which is amazing to me. But King Oyo of Uganda, of the Toro Kingdom, his whole family is a good friend of mine. And I've worked with them for 30 years. And I'll be there next week, and I'll go to the palace and sing the King Oyo song. King Oyo, King Oyo. you got to sing it like Africans. That's how the girls part singing. The other parts, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. Can, can you help me with that? Do the ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. Oh, King Oyo, King Oyo, you That's how that song goes. Yep. Thank you. I forgot the words. My point, and I close with this, is this. If you were going to put any of those cats together, any of those tables are your favorite people ever, I mean, he would, King David would be there. And if you were going to ask him, what's your secret sauce? What's your secret of success? How in the world did you possibly accomplish this? What in the world? Tell me what it is. He would say this. Lord, I have set you continually before me. He would say, My secret sauce is that I set the Lord continually before me. I didn't get everything right. I didn't do everything right. I didn't, you know, I made some colossal mistakes. I want to tell you that. (laughs) Oh, he's a train wreck sometimes. The idea that you can't love people in history because you found out they're flawed has been taught to you by some woke idealist. Throw it out the window because that ain't how it works. King David was beautifully flawed. I'm talking about, man, when he messed up, it was like my grandson learning how to ride a bike messed up. Missing teeth. And got him up, bawling and squalling, that was awesome. Do you know you're missing a tooth? It looks so cool. Like, really, Papa? Do they really look awesome? Do they really look awesome or are you the play it? Like, look, you look at it. He's like, dude, that does look awesome. Okay, well, that's how it works in the kingdom. Train wreck. So, (laughs) but if you ask him, what is your secret sauce? 
Say, yeah, I, I set the Lord continually before me. I set him, meaning he was my king in the world that I lived in. I set him continually before me. He was my king in the world that I lived in. And in light of everything that I did and all that I was a part of, I can tell you this right now, I, I never found a world I couldn't live in if Jesus wasn't on the throne in it. So covenant within your heart, and I feel the Lord moving right now. I feel, can y'all feel the Holy Spirit moving right now? Because I can. Jesus, I love you, Lord. Jesus, I praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to covenant with the Lord right now and say, Lord, I will set you continually before me this year. When I look at history, I want to see you. When I look at my present, I want to see you. When I look at my future, I want to see you so that I can say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is yet to come. I want to be able to do that because I'm a kingdom person. I'm not just somebody who lives in Washington. I'm a resident of heaven who's passing through Washington. I am not just a Texan. I'm a resident of heaven that is living in Texas. Texas comes and goes. There's good things about Texas and terrible things about Texas. I'm a kingdom man, and I will set the Lord continually before me. Love you, Jesus. I want you guys to take out your envelopes, if you would. I want you to hold them up before you open them. Just take them out. There you go. See, y'all are so, some of y'all already opened it. Cheater, cheater, pumpkin eater. Father God, I pray, God, that this would be a word. I pray, God, that you would move. Guys, can I have one, please, too, if somebody has one? I pray, Father God, sir, that this would be a word. I don't want to steal yours, Ladybug. No, it's not. It's not? Okay. You could steal from Jamie. He's good. Thank you, ma'am. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, God, that you would speak. And King Jesus, sir, we open up our hearts. And, God, we're willing, sir, to have a new ear in this new year. Some way, God, that we've never heard you before. Can I ask you guys to uh, come up here in the band, if you would? And I pray, Father God, sir, for this next five minutes, God knowing, sir, that when we seek you, we find you, that when we knock, you always open that door. Jesus, I love you, Lord. We knock today in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, if you would, please open this up for me. Hallelujah. King Jesus. Young man behind the camera right there. Hey, how are you? I bless you and call you blessed. You know, sometimes God calls us to come away for a long, long, long ways away from things. And he says, okay, that's what it's always been about, but it's going to be different with you. And then when you start going through those things, you find out, no, I have my place, but it doesn't look like what I thought it was going to look. And it's not the way that I thought it was going to be but it's better. You have that all over you. 
You have that all over you. And one of the things is one of the things that has happened is you've actually made it look easy to be you because you made good choices and you made good decisions and there wasn't a big train wreck and you weren't high maintenance, so therefore, you know what, you must be, everything must be fine. And because of that, it causes people to not see some things that they want to see, but to just see the Lord highlighting you, favor going through the roof, things that you've been passed up on that you won't be passed up. Amen. Just that this is a favorable year of the Lord for you. The Spirit, of, the Spirit of God is with you. You are a good son, he says. You're a good son. Just declare the Lord's goodness on you in Jesus' name. Amen. Was that a good word? Yeah, was it? Did it actually hit home? You, there's a lot of mileage on you, man. Talk about geographical miles. There's a lot of mileage on you for as young as you are. Are you local from here? Was you born here? Where Where was you born at? Oh, in Congo. Okay. There's a few miles between here and Congo, I'd say. <laughs> Hallelujah. That was a good word, man. That was a true word. When God brings you a long ways, you think you know what it's going to look like, and it doesn't. And a big part of that is because you never could imagine what he actually had for you. Thank you for making good choices, man. The Lord sees you, brother. Proud of you. How many of you guys got a word from the Lord just then? You got a word from the Lord? How many of you guys can say, this is my word, and you, you got this word? I have no idea. If, if, you, if you got the same word to the person next to you, that's an anomaly because there's hundreds of those words. I, I don't know. If there's, is there any spouse in here that y'all got the same word? That you guys are spouses? No? Okay. Me and Leanna got the same word at the beginning of the year. I was like, whoa, how about that? I think that this is our word. Maybe there's a big boom in your word right here, but if, if there's not, just hold on to it and let the Lord talk to you about it. Profess the word, declare that this is a word that, that came to me. It came to me from almost 2,000 miles away from here and also to several months back, and it got here today, and this word belongs to you. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, let this word be real and alive to us. And God, I love you and praise you and thank you, God. Let it be according to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Darren, I'm going to bring you back up here. Guys, thank you all so much for putting up with me. I love you. Call you blessed, blessed, blessed in Jesus' name. Well, now that was that was good. Um, let's say that you're going to be having lunch this afternoon, okay? Which which I sense you will be doing. I, I don't say it as a prophet. I just, but I do feel that uh, you could have three prophets from all time at the, three to five. Who's counting? Um, joining for lunch. Who, who's it going to be? Are you talking about people alive today? No, of, of all time. Well, no joke, I would have King David because I really believe that King David knew and understood Jesus a thousand years before he was born. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I believe he yeah. had a tremendous revelation in King Jesus. I would, I would probably say John G. Lake would be one, and I would love to ask him about, tell me about it when God told you to turn down that ticket, that first-class ticket to get on the Titanic. I don't know if you guys know that or not. I've done a huge study on the Titanic. i got a book coming out next year about it. And John G. Lake was given a ticket that cost the man $140,000 in 1912. And he got it and was walking on and went, God's telling me not to do this. Jack and Rose were on the Titanic. True story. I've seen her picture, but it was a little lewd. Okay. You know, it was like, gotta have to cumber some of that up, you know. 
Jack could have not drawn everything he drawn. We, were, we did a panel once with Patricia King, and we were having a conversation like this. Do you remember that? Patricia <laughs> she goes, she goes, she goes, boys, yeah. do you remember that? <laughs> she got on to us. She corrected us. <laughs> we need Patricia this morning. She goes, boys. All right, so King David, John G. Lake. <laughs> Who else? There is a, there's an African prophet that everybody doesn't know about, and he recently passed away, and he resurrected tons of people. And he actually, he came home, found out that his wife had died a week earlier. He's like, nobody told me because he was out in the bush somewhere. I love how people walk with God in, in Africa. And it's funny how all the people that God gave me a word for, he gave me a word for somebody from Congo. Did y'all catch that? Like, that's a big deal. Like, I have a, I've got an anointing for that. Anyway, he came home and told everybody, um, what happened? He said, well, your wife died. He said, dig her up. I didn't get to pray for her. And they literally dug her up. And he said, clean her off. And they cleaned her off. And then he spent a day praying for her. And that night, they had dinner together. God Almighty resurrected. Awesome? I want that cat. I want that cat sitting at my table. I'm like, hey, let's talk about that. Wow. That's amazing. Hey, a uh, question for you. Uh, uh, after this session, you'd be good to uh, to hang out there, sign a couple books. Yeah, I'll get out there right now. That'd be great. Hey, Troy Brewer, guys, come on. Let's give him a big thank you for that session. Love you. If somebody uh, can make sure that he makes it there, that'd be great. We lost him at one conference, but we got him back. Hey, uh, you are loved. Get some lunch, okay? Um, I, I think you're supposed to take your valuables with you. Um, uh, just because, all right, whatever. We'll be back at 2 p.m. for our prophetic panel. You will not want to miss that. Bless you. Get your cake pops.